Uh, Maria Luisa, uh, you are mute. Okay. Thank you, Isabel. Welcome, everyone. Bienvenidos, bienvenidas. Um, we, we have interpretation available for this session. There will be one speaker that will be speaking in Spanish. So if you require that, please make sure you, you choose your language. Tendremos interpretación para esta sesión. Eh, la sesión será en inglés y tendremos una persona que va a hablar en español. Entonces, en caso de que ustedes prefieran escuchar en español, pueden seleccionar eh, la interpretación simultánea, el botón que está abajo, y ahí podrán eh, elegir el idioma en el que quieren escuchar. Eh, de paso, por favor, escriban su nombre, organización, desde dónde se unen. Recuerden también seleccionar que el mensaje sea enviado a todos, eh, porque está, está establecido de otra forma en, en Zoom. Eh, please tell us your name, your organization, and where you're joining from, um, so that we can know who's, who's in the session. Uh, we will be starting in a couple of seconds. Okay, thank you all for being here. I would like to introduce this session in which we will be hearing about biodiversity conservation and climate change and, and specifically about nature-based solutions. So what, what, what are conservation trust funds doing in the region and how can we learn from their experience? Um, we will have scientists and conservation finance practitioners And we will have a uh, moderation by Melissa Moy, who is the Senior Director of Conservation Finance at WWF. Melissa's current work focuses on impact investing and sustainable financing for large scale conservation area initiatives. She's recognized as a startup specialist. She has catalyzed the creation of several conservation funds and debt for nature swaps and has developed sustainable financing mechanisms and financial modeling for WWF's um, portfolio of finance for permanent deals in Brazil, Bhutan, Colombia, and Peru. Uh, prior to joining WWF in 2003, Melissa negotiated debt for development swaps and advised developing county governments on debt management. Um, Melissa, thank you for your time. Thank you for being a part of this. Um, and I give you the floor so that you can moderate this excellent panel. Hi, everybody. It's such a pleasure here to, to, to be here with you at Redlac. Um, wish we could be together in person. Um, so I um, have the pleasure of um, introducing you to a, a really important topic. Um, in these times uh, and also to a super panel representing a diver diverse points of view. Um, I'd just like to begin by framing up um, a few ideas around nature-based solutions. Nature has the potential to solve some of the world's great problems. Um, and when we invest in healthy and well-managed ecosystems to solve these problems, we're using nature-based solutions. I think you can't um, go through any conservation finance panel with under, without understanding some of the numbers around the, these problems. And so right now, UNEP estimates that there's about 133 billion going into nature-based solutions, but the financing gap um, is estimated at 536 billion. So conservation trust funds can play a critical role in, in terms of um, meeting that financial gap Um, working on uh, blended finance, as well as uh, making sure that finance makes its way to the field. Um, our speakers will share some of their experience with how nature-based solutions have been applied in their uh, country contexts. Um, for example, you can look at healthy forests, which provide clean air and water, protect communities from erosion and landslides, and fight climate change. Healthy coral reefs, which shelter shorelines from flooding, storm surges, and erosion, and mangroves, which offer um, carbon sequestration as well as resilience against sea level rise and storm surge. And also, don't forget opportunities for local communities to establish nature based livelihoods. And that's only a sampling of um, different ways that nature based solutions can make a difference. I mean, when you look at issues like food security or disaster risk reduction, Um, there's so much to talk about. Um, I invite you to take a look at WF's new report on 
empowering nature. Uh, and Jake, my colleague Jake, will share the link in the in the chat. Um, as I mentioned, our speakers represent a diversity of different perspectives from business to science to protected areas management. Rene Gonzalez Montaguet was appointed Director General of the Mexico Fund in 2020 in rec recognition of her long service um, at the Fondo Mexicano, um, where she served as Director of the Fund for Protected Areas, as well as Director of Conservation. In these roles, uh, she was responsible for developing programs with the Global Environment Facility, the German government, and the Green Climate Fund. She also supported the creation of several uh, private regional funds and the design of state funds. And Renee earned her BA in biology from Occidental College and her PhD from Harvard University. Our second panelist, Alvin Alzamora, is project manager at the Natural Resources Conservation Foundation, Fundacion Natura in Panama. Alvin has more than 20 years of experience in the design and implementation of participatory uh, biodiversity conservation projects and protected area systems. He is in charge of leading project design and implementation processes for Fundacion Natura. And he was part of the technical team of the Directorate of Protected Areas and Biodiversity within Panama's Ministry of Environment. Alvin is a biologist with a master's degree in natural protected areas. Our third speaker, Carolyn Trubotskoy, serves as chairperson of the St. Lucia National Conservation Fund and is also a member of the board of the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund. Uh, Carolyn is executive director, marketing and operations of Anne's Chestanet and Jade Mountain Resorts, which are located near St. Lucia's Pitons World Heritage Site. She has held senior roles in the St. Lucia Hotel and Tourism Association and the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism, Tourism Association. She was appointed envoy to the Caribbean Challenge Initiative to bring awareness and build up resilience of the marine and coastal resources in the Caribbean. Carolyn holds a degree in business administration with majors in both tourism marketing and hotel and restaurant management from the University of Applied Sciences in Munich. Finally, Monica Gamboa is Marine Conservation Manager for the Forever Costa Rica Association. She has more than 20 years of experience working in marine conservation, biodiversity, climate change issues, and marine and coastal governance processes, particularly in the integration of these subjects in the long term with fisheries research and other conservation institutions. Monica studied marine biology and freshwater systems at the Universidad Nacional of Costa Rica and earned a master's in marine sciences from the Universidad Católica del Norte in Chile. Um, I would uh, remind you all that you're welcome to submit questions in the Q&A and uh, please make sure you, you indicate uh, your name, and your institution and where you're writing from. Um, but now we'll start uh, with a question which I've, I'm posing to, to all of the panelists, which is very simply, what is your experience with nature-based solutions? Um, Renee is going to kick off um, our uh, session. Uh, and Renee, great to see you. Um, and I'm just going to turn off my video and take it away. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa. This is uh, really great to, to see everybody, so many friends. And uh, today I would like to share with you some of the experiences from the Mexican Fund for the Conservation of Nature. I hope that this is working. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, I, the Mexican Fund for the Conservation of Nature has 27 years where we've been working with all sectors of society to actually work uh, towards uh, our natural capital. So I'm going to show you one example of the, uh, of the things that we've been doing with nature-based solutions, or as the Green Climate Fund likes to call it, ecosystem-based adaptation. This actually comes from a GF-funded project. And as you know, Mexico has a topography full of mountains. It's one of the most mountainous countries in the world. And here you can see a watershed that actually goes into the Pacific Ocean. And here is another watershed that goes into the Gulf of Mexico. You can see the topography, really high mountains very close to the ocean. And those dots that you see are actually uh, with um, meteorological stations, weather stations. And so what we did is for the Green Climate Fund, we went ahead and studied 
what had been the precipitation and the temperature in those watersheds over the last 30 years in a project that we wanted to actually work in the restoration of rivers. And, and this is very important because in these watersheds you have protected areas, but as you know, the veins of the watersheds are the rivers. So you want to connect those protected areas. And so you want, you know, biodiversity to have uh, a way to move along those biological corridors and adapt to climate change. We were astonished when we found that in the upper watershed of one of these uh, watersheds that you just saw, which is the one leading to the Gulf of Mexico, over the 30 years, there's already a clear tendency towards increased precipitation. And what we are seeing here is that when there is no forest cover, you have a lot of soil erosion and that soil actually covers, clogs all these rivers and actually what happens way below in the lower watershed is that actually the opposite trend is what's happening. You have lower precipitation and that lower precipitation causes droughts and you know, with um, just uh, plants just vanishing, then you actually have that when the water comes from the upper watershed, you actually have a particularly important floods. And so one way to address this was to actually try to understand why was it that in the upper watershed, more water was coming. And this seems to happen due to the proximity to the ocean of these watersheds, because there's an increase in hurricanes. And you can see here the trend over the last hundred years, and it's really impressive. And um, so, I mean, really climate change is here. It was great for the proposal, but it was really kind of, uh, you know, disheartening to see that this is really happening. What we saw from the GF project is that there's a, you know, nature-based solution that is ready to just, you know, a low hanging fruit. And is if you just put a lot of trees and a lot of vegetation, native vegetation along those riparian corridors, along those uh, rivers, and this is two kilometers in uh, 1.4 kilometers, you will see that after four years of reforestation of just this restoration, natural restoration, then you actually have a reduction by half of the uh, coliform bacteria and also a reduction also by half of the suspended solids. So really what plants are doing is retaining soils and therefore you actually have better water quality and you actually have less sediments going into, you know, just uh, clogging the rivers and then having floods way below. So we're working on this with the, with the Green Climate Fund, the co-financing is with the GF, the National Institute for Ecology and Climate Change is leading the technical aspects. And, uh, you know, as uh, I said in the previous panel, the Environmental Fund is linking all the different sectors. And I just want to share with you guys a cartoon from a very good friend of ours and uh, uh, that just shows this cartoon actually won some prizes and it just shows that nature after 4 billion years comes up with absolutely wonderful solutions and they're there to grab and make use of them. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm having trouble with my video, but I will. Um, there I go. Uh, Renee, thanks for going so quickly. You got me, uh, you know, too quickly. I love your cartoon. Um, I did want to follow up with you on the Green Climate Fund question, because I, I know a number of um, funds in Redlack have, in fact, become accredited with the Green Climate Fund. And you told me the other day that, in fact, the Green Climate Fund is using a different term for nature-based solutions. And I guess what I'm interested in is, is, is the, the term that you um, described, is that, um, is that, does it have a different meaning? And what's the implication for funds? Um, and just to make it a bit more difficult for you, um, can you just speak to the fact that the Green Climate Fund is well focused more on climate change Obviously, the, your primary objective as a conservation fund is oriented more around biodiversity conservation. So how do you reconcile that when you're trying to develop projects? Well, we learned a lot from the Green Climate Fund, and we actually uh, connected with a lot of climatologists, and that was very interesting. 
And definitely the Green Climate Fund is focused on climate change and it has to be adaptation or mitigation. And you have to show that the actions that you're doing in the field have a direct connect connection with the trends in climate that you are addressing. And so they will not help you in river restoration for pollution because that's something that governments have to invest in. Uh, they will help you with all those issues that are really related to, to climate. And so that's why I'm showing you the graphs of uh, you know higher precipitation in the upper watershed, lower precipitation in the lower watersheds. Those are 30 year long intervals and they're trends already. And once you see those trends, then you have to decide what you're going to do and in adaptation, ecosystem-based adaptation, and that's why that term is important, then that's when you actually use different kinds of solutions where of obviously nature has just a repertoire of tools that you can uh, grab and make use of. So it's very important to actually, you know, structure that logic, that the climate logic for the Green Climate Fund. And then with GF, with the Global Environment Facility, then you can go into the biodiversity aspects. And when you combine both, which, you know, restoration riparian corridors is just that because it's, you know, biological corridors and it's addressing at the same time the adaptation to these changes in, to climate, then you have a solid case where you can put these two funding sources together uh, with other financial mechanisms that come from the private sector, uh, such as uh, microfinancing for impact investment and carbon credits and other things. So, you know, it's just it's just a matter of putting it all together. Yeah, it definitely sounds like a puzzle. Um, so let's turn over to Alvin now. Um, Hola, saludos. Eh, presento mi, en este momento. Eh, por favor, confirmarme si se ve. Listo, para mí es un placer estar aquí con todos ustedes. Eh, quiero mostrar la iniciativa y cómo abordamos el tema de, de estas soluciones. Eh, una de las cosas que eh, René nos indica es eh, la, la toma de decisión a base de, de información científica y eh, no lo voy a abordar yo, voy a, voy a abordar otra parte que es muy importante, la, las comunidades y cómo empoderamos a esas comunidades de la toma de decisión de esa información. Eh, para nosotros en Panamá es muy claro que nuestro país se mueve a través del agua, donde el alimento, la agricultura, el clima y la energía están influidas por, por estos aspectos de cambio climático y debemos comenzar a hacer algo. Y es la forma, es la forma de, de pasar de la teoría a los hechos, es lo que quiero presentar ahora. Para nosotros, nuestras acciones, nuestra planificación eh, está muy eh, ligada a una planificación adaptativa que permite hacer tres cosas importantes. Ayudar a las comunidades a adaptarse, hacer uso de la biodiversidad y los servicios ecosistémicos y eh, hacer uso de las políticas nacionales e internacionales. Esto nos permite reducir la vulnerabilidad social y ambiental, generar beneficios eh, restaurar, mantener y eh, pensando en la salud de los ecosistemas. También en gestionar el conocimiento que es muy importante, no solamente para la organización, no es solamente para la natura, sino para los actores en el territorio, para esas comunidades que al final de cuentas deben aplicar esas adaptaciones. ¿Qué queremos? Como ejemplo, tenemos, les estoy mostrando que podemos utilizar los los patrones climáticos para introducir nuevas eh, variedades de cultivo que permitan ser eh, resilientes a las comunidades para que puedan asegurar la calidad de vida de, de, de las comunidades y así mismo también optar por oportunidades de mercado, generar nuevas alternativas de ingresos para el productor, que es muy importante. Nos tratamos de asegurar en todos los procesos de natura que haya buenas prácticas para el manejo de cultivos que haya siempre acciones de conservación de suelos e infraestructuras verdes, tecnología adaptada a la conservación. Algo simple eh, eh, es la gestión del agua dentro de las fincas eh, con las que trabajamos. Eh, el agua, aunque hay en abundancia por precipitación, es mal gestionada. Eso, adaptar esas tecnologías simples para que sean accesibles a a todos los miembros de la comunidad es muy importante. 
fortalecer las capacidades y las destrezas técnicas de estos actores clave de estas comunidades es sumamente importante. Y la creación de negocios verdes, ¿por qué no? Es, debemos pensar en una conservación que permita mantener la, las condiciones de vida de las comunidades y mejorarlas. Muchas gracias. Also in record time, and once, oh, there it goes, okay. Um, so Alvin, I really appreciate the fact that you brought the whole question of uh, food into the our picture here. Um, and I'm just wondering whether um, in your view, um, contributing to food security for the communities is part of the picture, or is it, are you more focused on the business side of um, creating livelihood opportunities? Eh, magnífica pregunta. Eh, las comunidades con las que trabajamos tienen una realidad social muy específica. Si nosotros no podemos lograr que ellos accesen a mejores calidades de vida, a buena alimentación, a nuevos eh, sistemas de, de, de producción, van a seguir presionando a la naturaleza. Por ejemplo, es más fácil para ellos hacer potreros y avanzar la frontera agrícola que, eh, eh, que quedarse eh, sin hacer nada. Entonces, eh, esta presión eh, va directamente sobre áreas protegidas, áreas costero marinas y vamos perdiendo eh, la cobertura boscosa. Es necesario para disminuir, eliminar y concentrar esa, esa pérdida de, bio, de biodiversidad darle medios de, de, de buena alimentación. ¿Por qué? Porque así sustentamos la alimentación básica de las comunidades. No es solamente porque tenga un ingreso económico, es un medio de conservación, de evitar presiones a los ecosistemas. Great. Thanks so much, Alvin. Um, we'll now turn to Carolyn. Um, There's Carolyn. Uh, so over to you, Carolyn. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, if uh, Alvin could stop sharing, then I could start sharing my slide. Yeah, I think it's now possible. One second. I will take all the minutes that the other presenters didn't take advantage of and uh, hopefully entertain you as we look at St. Lucia and our conservation activities uh, here on island. Can you see my slide? Everybody good? Good. No so you, you, heard my, you heard my lengthy. Um, uh, you see it properly or has it gone down? Do I need to? Yes, just put it in presentation mode, please. Okay, very good. Yes, there we go. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, so hang on a second, sorry. So thank you for allowing me to be part of this panel today. Just to confirm, and you've heard my lengthy uh, introduction, I'm the chairperson of the St. Lucia National Conservation Fund. And my background has been um, for the past four decades, almost hospitality and tourism. I've held so many volunteer leadership positions, uh, uh, especially here in St. Lucia as president of the St. Lucia Hospitality and Tourism Association. Um, and also I served as the president of the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association from 2016 to 2018. During all of these presidencies, the region had to deal with so many different natural disasters, some of them made worse um, by the effects of climate change, such as, such as the 2017 hurricanes. It certainly has caused my personal journey to veer away from tourism marketing and I have become an advocate for resilience building preservation and conservation of our fragile ecosystems. The St. Lucia National Conservation Fund is a relatively young organization. It is an NGO and our local hotel and tourism association is actually one of its founding members. It was incorporated in 2016 and launched in 2018. 
To very briefly explain, the fund was a result of the efforts that started with the Caribbean Challenge Initiative, which I would simply describe as the first Caribbean-centric effort to recognize the importance of preservation of the Caribbean marine environment, which they expressed in their 2020 goals to protect 20% of the marine and coastal environment by 2020. And now, of course, we have to look and see what uh, 2030 holds. The Caribbean Biodiversity Fund itself was established in 2012, and currently the CBF, Caribbean Biodiversity Fund, has two programs, the Conservation Finance Program, anchored by a 80 million uh, endowment fund and a climate change program fo focused on ecosystem-based adaptation, which has a $50 million sinking fund. In order to be able to draw funding from the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund, conservation funds needed to be created on a national level. And this is how the SLUNCF came into being. We are now one of 10 funds that have been created and reform what is called the Caribbean Sustainable Finance Architecture, which is described as a network of independent Caribbean conservation trust funds that are dedicated to mobilizing uh, financial resources at the regional, sub-regional and national levels for various conservation efforts. So our overall mandate is to raise funds to provide financing for nationally determined natural resources management and ecosystem conservation and also restoration activities. This also includes support to ecologically dependent communities and livelihoods. The model with the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund is set up so that we have to provide matching funds in order to draw from the CBF. And I would like to say that here in St. Lucia, we have been very successful to find matching funds. Uh, first of all, we uh, managed to uh, receive matching funds from our local tourism enhancement fund, an organization I'm very proud of because I was the uh, founder of the tourism enhancement fund in a, in a previous life as president of the hotel association. And we also found funding from a large grocery store here in St. Lucia, Massey. And that has certainly helped us to get on our way and also in turn issue our own call for proposals on a local level and provide funding to a number of projects. Whilst the funding has predominantly come from the CBF and from Tourism Enhancement Fund and Massey, we have had other successes in attracting additional funding. For example, our partnership with the Inter-American Foundation to support capacity building of various community groups on island so that they know better how to find support mechanisms. But clearly, you know, finding funding mechanisms and finding funding continues to, to be a challenge. St. Lucia is a very tourism dependent island. As a matter of fact, we are one of the most tourism dependent countries in the world. A lot of the big ticket items, as I call them, that affect the country are also important um, and affect tourism. We know that a successful tourism industry needs a healthy marine and coastal environment. So I'm not only talking about the effects of climate change, which we know only too well, but I also want to highlight some of the other big ticket items which affect us here, which is the entire area of our water management, the recreational water quality, our wastewater management and waste management really in total. Um, and also the fact that we have very few recycling opportunities. We of course struggle badly with reducing plastics on island. And we also have very little opportunity is this time to introduce renewable energy. When it comes to um, preservation and conservation of the marine space, we have been able to forge a new relationship and I want to briefly touch on this uh, as I believe it is um, um, the result of, of what we hear now that really everybody wants to look at tourism and see a, a more sustainable future of tourism. So there's an interest by tourism business operators, tourism destinations and also government to create healthy and mar um, healthy marine and coastal environments because we realize that that is so important for our successful economies of the future. So today, only today, we have announced a new uh, partnership that will help us to create a funding mechanism that would support a number of projects. And this partnership is a partnership um, together with the Hotel Association here with a website and a platform called Voyage, spelled in the Creole, Creole way. 
What we have seen is out of the pandemic came a renewed desire to create a more sustainable future for tourism. With that said, we want to draw on the fact that both travelers and tourism enterprises want to be seen as travel, as, as travel, uh, either traveling responsibly or operating responsibly. There are a number of platforms out there now that allow travelers to offset their carbon footprint. By working with Voyage, we were able to create St. Lucia-centric carbon offset projects. For example, preservation of mangroves would be one of them. However, we are also working on a very exciting offshoot of this collaboration, and that centers around marine health and coral preservation. We have already done tremendous work in this area, thanks to the additional funding received from the local tourism enhancement fund that has allowed us to support the creation of um, artificial reefs, um, for example, and um, we are now looking at creating a specific fund for coral reef restoration that would allow different interest groups, whether they are public or private sector, to apply for funding from the conservation fund from this particular marine health fund. I think this is the introduction I would give us the St. Lucia National Conservation Fund. Um, we have just published a new call for local proposals. And given the fact that we're still coming out of this pandemic, we have decided to keep the project amount on the smaller side. And um, basically, we want to distribute the funding available to more community groups uh, in our hope to make a difference. Um, so um, the, the focal point for this new call for proposals is to directly support improved food security and biodiversity based livelihoods in St. Lucia. That would be my presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, I just wanted to follow up because you're the, the sole um, private sector um, representative on the panel. And given your experience, um, I'm wondering whether you think that the private sector is going to step up more in terms of supporting nature-based solutions. I mean, are you seeing a trend um, in the Caribbean or St. Lucia going in that direction where there's more investment? And I mean, private investment, not, not just uh, philanthropic funding. I think that, um local businesses, not just tourism businesses, all have really recognized the importance to, to support various conservation and restoration efforts. I think that sometimes we bring to the table too complex of reports, and there's also a little bit of duplication of efforts. My big mantra has been for us to create working groups that identify what I would call the low hanging fruits and then present them to the private sector in a fashion that they can easily uh, envision and also see the, the light at the end of the tunnel so that you really can say, if you support this, we will have a result for you and this result you know, will be this and that. So I think there is, there is readiness, there's willingness. We all understand uh, what climate change can do to us and uh, what we need to do to work against it. Um, so I definitely see that we are very much aligned whether you speak to private sector groups or government groups, but we need to break it down into these, I would say, realistic projects that we can push from point A to all the way to the end. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. So I'd now like to turn um, the floor over to Monica Gamboa with Forever Costa Rica. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello. Hi, Melissa. And it's a pleasure for me to be sharing this screen with Renee and Alvin and Caroline. Let me go through my presentation. So yeah, Forever Costa Rica Association, we are an environmental fund that promotes the conservation of marine and terrestrial ecosystem in perpetuity. So we are members, of course, of Red Lake, but we also uh, are members of Pacifico, which is a platform that uh, works for the conservation of the intertropical Pacific. Uh, through our different uh, trust funds, we are able to work uh, not just in the marine uh, conservation, but also in terrestrial conservation inside the protected areas and also outside working specifically with the communities. Uh, in terms of marine protected um, uh, conservation that we have been doing, uh, we have and work under a public-private partnership with the CINAC 
And recently, we also have a partnership with the Fisheries Authority from Costa Rica. So we already have 11 years supporting, uh, supporting coastal and oceanic uh, marine protected areas through the Forever Costa Rica Trust Fund. Uh, so far, uh, we have like an, uh, invested $3 million uh, in 17 marine protected areas uh, in Costa Rica. And actually, uh, currently we are part of the scientific committee created by the government for the achievement of the 30% protection of our uh, exclusive economic zone. So we uh, also collaborate uh, with the government of Costa Rica to create the last four marine protected areas of the country, uh, increasing the marine protected areas uh, in 11, a little more than 11, thousand kilometer square kilometers. Um, also, we, we have this goal to support the government in the accomplishment of global conservation goals, specific, specifically the 30 by 30 goals. And uh, right now we have uh, what we call the uh, Azul Por Siempre or Fondo Azul Por Siempre Forever Blue Fund to seek this financial sustainability of the marine protected areas uh, with these ambitious goals. So the example I want to share with you today, it's uh, one that we have been developing uh, specifically in the Pacific coast of Costa Rica in the province of Guanacaste. And I would love to start um, Highlighting this is a joint effort between Forever Costa Rica Association, the Guanacaste Artisanal Fisheries Chamber, the Fisheries Authority, and uh, Tempisque Conservation Area, and Universidad Nacional. And it is very important to know that this joint effort is what really makes this uh, project and this process uh, very successful. So uh, the project itself, we call it Pesca Conciencia, which is like a you know, word game uh, that refers uh, to do fisheries uh, consciously and based on science. Um, so uh, part of the uh, main goals is uh, to, to take in account the artisanal small scale fishermen as part of this fishery monitoring program and uh, they have been part of the creation and the implementation of sustainable fisheries plants. Um, right here, and at this point, uh, our main concern is uh, to make the coastal uh, communities to better understand the importance of this simple biological and life cycle data, uh, just to, to because we don't want to be there taking the data and asking for them to take the data if they do not understand what everything, all this thing means. So we really uh, want them to use this kind of data to support and to uh, better implement their activities uh, on local fisheries. So all this uh, at the end to adapt uh, their activity to climate change and all, um, you know, all these adaptations that they will need to start doing soon and introducing uh, some custom technology because you know the technology in fisheries is pretty um, expensive. So we are supporting uh, technology that it's uh, created especially for them. And that uh, it's gonna improve a traceability system. And at the end, it's gonna increase the value change of their products. So locally, um, we are also working on a local responsible consumers um, project or, or you know, part of this uh, whole process to support and to start increasing the seasonal fishing consuming and the diversification of the consumption of the uh, marine products. So in general, some challenges that we have um, facing, uh, climate change and biodiversity loss is still unknown uh, issues in local communities. And that give us difficulties to develop that feeling of belonging and conservation over what is not known. So another uh, big thing is the low level of education of these local uh, coastal communities 
uh, with its equal to slow learning processes. And definitely what I think it's a, a, a big le uh, lection here, it's the time lag of local communities versus the speed at which changes occur because the climate change is a huge challenge that we are facing at this point. Uh, thank you, Melissa. This was my presentation for today. Great. Thank you so much. Um, just to follow up on um, your Pesca Conciencia model, um, I'm wondering whether, how long has the program been going on so far? Uh, so far, three years. At this okay. point, with, with uh, several communities, around eight communities, uh, and they are next to two different protected areas. And do you feel like at this point you have some recommendations you might share with other funds if they were developing a similar program? I mean, I think you mentioned some of the challenges, but have you actually changed the program to adapt to those challenges? Yeah, definitely. And as you mentioned at some point, um, this is a program with a double strategy, right? Because we are dealing uh, with the food security, you know, issues that are happening in our coastal communities, but also because we uh, believe we need to create more livelihood opportunities. And in some of these communities to diversify uh, those livelihoods is not that easy. They are very attached to their traditional activities. So we are investing a lot of time, you know, and funds to make their traditional activi activities uh, more blue activities. So uh, transformation, little transformations that really uh, makes the difference. And we definitely need to, uh, to show the, in, the improve of the income of these communities to really convince them to be part of it, right? So it's, um, I think the time lag, it's something that it is very important to take in account for other trust funds that uh, want to start working with the local coastal communities. But also we have all this pressure, right, about climate change happening right now. I mean, every single second counts. So it's, it's difficult to deal with this uh, difference on the times. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so I'd like to invite all of the panelists to turn their cameras on right now. And there's Salvin, great. So um, we'll just do one round of quick reactions to a, a question, and then I'm going to turn to the audience um, Q&A. So we don't have a, we have representatives of funds here, and then I think we have a private sector representative, but um, we don't have anyone from government. Um, but I noticed that Alvin worked in the government for a while, not very long, but enough. And so I'm just curious whether, um, you have any, and I'm, I'm addressing this question to everyone, um, how you see the role of government in terms of setting the stage for developing nature-based solutions. You know, do you think that nature-based solutions, for example, can be integrated into national conservation and sustainable development plans? Um, is there, for example, a link to the uh, NDC framework, uh, the National Determined Contribution Commitments, um, you know, and how do, how do you as a fund um, take advantage, but also help to develop those sorts of policies? So Alvin, I'd like to start with you because you have this, um, this background in government. Eh, sí, mira, eh, lo veo así, y, y te pongo el claro ejemplo de Fundación Natura. Fundación Natura tiene más de 30 años de estar, de estar en proceso de co-creación eh, eh, buscando soluciones con las autoridades nacionales y las comunidades locales. Entonces, eh, es posible hacerlo. Muchas veces nosotros intentamos eh, con, con, con números, con datos, hacer que se mueva el Estado, pero él tiene una velocidad propia. Eh, nosotros lo que debemos hacer es ese, eh, eh, ese empuje más con la comunidad y llevar a las comunidades y el Estado a un punto intermedio 
donde podamos de nuevo, lo digo, co-crear esas soluciones que te permitan proteger, restaurar, gestionar de manera sostenible. Es posible, es difícil, pero se, se logra. En los últimos 10 eh, años, Fundación Natura eh, ha logrado, eh, en conjunto con el gobierno, establecer buenas alianzas, tener buenos aciertos y también lecciones muy buenas para replicar y para mejorar. Eh, si es factible, simplemente debemos poner más empeño. Great, thanks so much. Does anyone else care to answer that question? I would love to, to share something that uh, really works for us and for every Costa Rica Association. I mean, we need to uh, really make the government institutions stronger and make them work together jointly because there's, uh, you know, several institutions that are working for the same objective, but they, they have this lack of coordination that at the end, um, who pays that uh, big bill, it's the communities, right? So uh, we, we really, as uh, environmental funds, we can uh, make these different stakeholders convene together. And uh, doing that, we definitely can accelerate, you know, the process of conservation. Just to follow up to Renee, relative to, you mentioned the whole uh, question of blended finance. So public, private, diverse sources of financing, but I really didn't hear you say much about government in, in that financing mix. Um, I'm curious whether, is that a, a role for government in, in terms of um, coming from the budget or from some other source, which in fact could be innovative financing? Yeah, Melissa, I think it's a very important question. And I agree with Alvin, things go slow at the government. It's, uh, you know, there's large institutions, but the important thing is that it's a, not a monolithic, uh, you know, sector. And so you can find people that are understanding these complex issues like blended financing or carbon offsets or impact investment, you know, all these buzzwords that have been coming out in the last uh, years where you actually need a lot of collaboration between sectors. So that's, I think, when you actually have to start sitting down with all these forums and it's going to be a lot of time, but uh, some uh, of public officials are just going to get it right away. And, you know, whenever the opportunity opens up, they're going to run and actually get it done. And um, those openings don't happen that often, but when they do, you have to be prepared and just, uh, you know, help develop those human resources in all these um, government institutions so that when the machine is finally moving, they're ready to take the ball and run with it. And so um, in this project, it, it's actually led by the National Institute of Ecology and Climate Change. And it's been really interesting to sit down with 10 different government agencies that are working with the project. And some of them come from the financial sector and some from the environmental. And it's it's like a Babel Tower. I mean, you know, it's different languages. And so when the financial people come, they talk about risks. And when the, uh, you know, environmental people come, they talk about conservation and it's environmental risk and conservation. They're related, you know. And so I think that uh, CTFs, uh, the conservation trust funds can actually facilitate uh, those translations that are required and, uh, and search for common ground, which is what we need for the future. Carolyn, I imagine, you know, with your big experience in the tourism sector, you must be thinking about these multi-sectoral issues all the time. Indeed, um, I want to just comment briefly on innovative finance mechanisms. And I think the pandemic has forced all of us to really see what's out there and what can really um, happen. And I think that uh, I've seen coming out of Jamaica, green resilience um, bonds. And um, there's also talk of bonds like blue bonds, blue resilience bonds. And I think this is something that should be further explored how it could be applied on a, on a broader scale um, within the Caribbean region. Um, there has also been a model of debt conversion um, presented um, that I think is very interesting. And uh, it has been um, 
uh, I am aware of the debt conversion model that was presented by the Nature Conservancy and has also maybe some islands interested, but I don't know where we stand with it, but I think debt conversion could also have an interesting uh, future. When it comes to, to governments, um, to be aligned, to really have common goals, I think is really important. I mean, um, we have such a strong tourism dependency. And I think when we look at nature-based solutions, definitely government perhaps needs to really set the framework of what is expected of existing operators, but also for any new development and really ensure that any new developer, for example, also makes a contribution um, towards our uh, water security, for example, um, or really um, pledges some support of a conservation effort. So I think the government has to continue playing a role, but I feel the conservation funds, um, whilst very focused on trying to raise funding, I think we also need to play a role perhaps as being the catalyst so that we actually highlight perhaps some of the opportunities. Uh, again, you're breaking it down into perhaps realistic projects that can be accomplished. And then you try to get buy-in from both your public and your private stakeholders. Great, thanks so much, Carolyn. Um, so I'd like to turn to a couple of audience questions now um, from Manuel Castrillo Duran. On what scale can we ex expect funds for the different sectors in immersed in the environment? Would it be mostly for small projects, for production, for education, for research? Would anyone care to address that question? Um Sure, at least what we are seeing is that there is a tendency for larger projects because of the, the scale of the, pro of the problem is so huge. Um, the international funding sources are looking for large interventions and they can be actually composed of smaller interventions, that, that's fine. But the, the fine of aggregating is becoming more and more important, both for impact in, um, investment, for carbon offsets. And uh, that is a real challenge because you want to have, uh, you, you want to scale up the impact, but how do you do it if your you know, experience has been with small projects and you have small local successes? So just the fact of ag aggregating and then having a larger impact, which is what the funding sources and I think the planet requires, is going to be an intellectual challenge. Great, thanks. Anyone else? So I have another question um, from, um, and, and this is also, it's actually for Renee. Uh, so we have Jorge Ramirez from the Charles Darwin Foundation. Um, and his question to Renee is how to overcome the barrier of sci scientifically demonstrating the impact of climate change on some element of the socio, socio ecosystem, since this requires research, which requires a lot of time specialized personnel and a lot of money. It's a little, well, little long. Did you get that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Actually, it's been, uh, you know, our experience with the Green Climate Fund has been uh, uh, extremely illustrating and, and it has been like really um, hard because we actually, that climate rationale, we didn't get it. And uh, climatologists help us with that. And uh, it's really interesting because you need the data that's already out there, especially if you're going to make that link between, you know, precipitation or temperature. Uh, what the Green Climate Fund is looking for is at a local scale. So even if you just have one meteorological station that has 30 years of data, that's enough, you know. And then right now there's models that you can actually download from a page, a web page that the Green Climate is putting together, and um, you can actually project into the future at a local scale with that data from the past. And so that helps with adaptation. Uh, with uh, mitigation, then you just have to show, you know, how much carbon you're going to capture in the future. And uh, satellite images, fortunately, are becoming much more accessible and less expensive. So it's just a matter of, yes, having scientific background, but not necessarily, at least for the founding sources, it requires to be a paper in science. You know, you have to use what's out there and actually, you know, just make sure that you um, sell it that it, and make sure the logic that it's not something that um, is development or biodiversity that what you are linking are your actions with the patterns that you're seeing that are linked to, to climate change. Great, thanks. 
So um, I have a question from Alejandro Jerem, excuse my pronunciation, but Jeremilio Luconi, and he'd like to learn more about development finance and crowdfunding campaigns instead of traditional uh, forms of financing for startup conservation oriented projects. Is there a financing model that incorporates these tools? So once again, it's a question more on the innovative financing side for nature-based solutions. Um, I'm wondering, does has anyone had any experience with crowdfunding in the group? No? Do you see potential? Yeah. We, we actually did in the past, um, for example, with Palo Verde National Park, uh, Costa Rica Por Siempre or Forever Costa Rica, uh, develop one of these uh, crowd uh, funding campaign, and it was very successful. Um, the, um, I mean, our recommendation is you really need to uh, find uh, a very specific, you know, uh, problem or or something and, and very specific issue that you want to make the main objective of the crowdfunding because you create expectations in, in the population that is, is gonna be participating at the crowdfunding. So it's uh, very important to, to choose something that you really have the chance to achieve in a short time, because people is gonna be asking for the results and you really need to deliver the results in a short time as well. Melissa, we cannot hear you. Um, to clarify, um, Alejandro was re referring actually to decentralized financing. His his acronym didn't resonate. So if that means anyone anything to someone, um, and also he's nautical operations and maritime development nomad in Costa Rica. Um, so I think. We have just eight minutes left and I am not seeing um, any other questions. So I'm going to um, actually ask um, any of you whether you have a question for each other. Because <laughs> um, I, I, I think sometimes in panels, we don't think about the fact that like your head is turning as we're going along because you heard something. Like I could hear a few, see a few nodding heads about um, what Carolyn was saying around the resilience bond question. Um, you know, and people thinking, well, maybe that could be of interest. Um, and, um, you know, results-based financing is another one. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, when we're thinking about nature-based solutions, um, it's, it's about the science on the ground, working with local communities, um, but then how do we get the larger, the finance coming from all kinds of different sources to that level? And I will just raise a question that's on my mind is, what do we do about standards, about making sure that whatever is being delivered through nature-based solutions um, is, is really credible. And that comes up a lot, of course, in carbon markets. And so I don't know whether anyone has, um, has much experience with carbon markets. Um, this is more of a, a marine crowd, I would say. Um, but I'm curious if anyone is, does have that on their mind. Um, so now I've asked a question, but you can also ask each other questions. So go ahead. Anyone? Well, I think Melissa, one, one question that I have uh, actually for, for Carolyn uh, looking at ecotourism and it's related to carbon offsets. Um, I think what we're facing right now with impact investment in, in tourism and, and is, is how do you create, maybe the, the, the funding part will not be the limiting factor, but it will be actually creating the human resources that can go into impact investment, into ecotourism, into doing carbon offsets that are correct. And I think that's going to be the limiting factor in both um, carbon offsets and in impact investment and in just you know building on the on the experience of Carolyn in ecotourism. Um, I, I wonder whether she could give us some pearls of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, you hit the nail on the head. The St. Lucia National Conservation Fund is still a very young organization, but uh, 
already working with Voyage and, and trying to come up with carbon offset projects that are localized. We already have run into a number of, I would say, ob obstacles. And so I do feel that what you have highlighted is, is an area, the um, uh, human resource side, the capacity that we need to be very aware of and, and build alongside. So it's not just uh, like, it's, it's easy to say we're going to do this project, but it really needs the build up. So there's a, I think this is why our progress has been slow because we realized that, okay, yes, that makes sense, but how do we get there? And so we have had to go through a number of steps. So I totally agree. I do have a question for Costa Rica. Um, I, now, I hope I got that right. Do you have a credit card company in Costa Rica that has made av available uh, a small part of the fee towards conservation? Is that ring a bell? Because uh, that I found a fascinating concept. Yes, uh, I'm not an expert on that specific issue, but we know uh, Banco Nacional from Costa Rica is a national bank. Uh, they actually deliver something like a model like this one you are mentioning. So we can definitely uh, get you in touch with, with them because it, it is really like a very innovative way, you know, for uh, finance, uh, this, this conservation um, efforts. So they are really, really um, engaged on uh, sustainability in general. So they are uh, creating very different uh, mechanisms for the conservation. I was very impressed when I heard that. And I think that if that model could be shared, I think, uh, you know, there's other banks in the, in the region that might very well be interested in learning more about how they set that up. You know, I, I know um, a number of different WWF offices have branded credit cards. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Me gustaría aportar la experiencia de Fundación Natura. Nosotros tenemos un, un acuerdo de cooperación, una relación muy interesante con un banco de la localidad que es también regional, eh, que trabajamos a través de una tarjeta de, de Fundación Natura donde partimos de los rendimientos de la tarjeta pasan a temas de conservación, específicamente a conservación, es eh, un mecanismo que... Alvin, se está cortando un poco. Tal vez si pudiera quitar su video para que la, la, la señal de internet sea un poco mejor. Adelante. Okay, we may have lost Alvin. Alvin tiene el micrófono cerrado, ahora sí. Sí, eh, un, es, es una estrategia con el combanismo muy interesante donde a través de los últimos ocho años se ha, se ha trabajado a través de los fondos de los rendimientos de esa tarjeta eh, en conservación de la biodiversidad, específicamente en la zona del Canal de Panamá. Es una experiencia bien interesante porque es un banco privado eh, de carácter regional donde eh, se ha volcado eh, y ha cambiado su ADN en la forma de hacer eh, responsabilidad social empresarial. Eh, para ello es, es parte de su ADN conservar, no ayudar a la sociedad, sino conservar. Gracias, Alvin. Um, so we did just get a, we have a comment from Edilberto Romero, the program for Belize, where he notes that Belize just launched a blue carbon bond initiative that will alleviate debt and protect a large marine area. I believe that's what Carolyn uh, was referring to, correct, Carolyn? Right. Um, so um, we only really have a few more minutes before we, we need to wrap up the session. Um, so I did want to thank all of you. I think that um, so far Redlack is off to a really great start. And um, I think that, um, you know, there's so many um, 
different themes we can explore with nature-based solutions. And one thing I found interesting about this topic is the fact that it's uh, it's really picked up steam, but it's attracting audiences who really didn't think that much about biodiversity before. Um, and to me, it's it's one of the most interesting um, aspects of it. Um, but I think that the science behind nature-based solutions is is really going to require a lot of work. And so I think that this um, this panel reflects that focus on on the work being science-based um, and multidisciplinary. Um, and um, so once again, I really did want to thank you all for your contributions and um, look forward to um, future discussions. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to James now. Um, but um, thanks a million and um, hope to see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you everyone for your participation in this session. Sorry. <laughs> thank you for your participation in this session. Um, coming up, we will be hearing from the St. Lucia National Conservation Fund again. And we will also hear from FIAES Ecuador, as well as, um, as Fonafifo from Costa Rica. So they will be telling us a little bit more about um, successful financial mechanisms. We will be hearing about the famous Payment for Environmental Services um, scheme uh, that Fonafifo manages from, also from St. Lucia, we will be hearing about their a community fund that they have just launched. And just for you to know, uh, also the, um, for, in the next session, you could ask this question again regarding the, the, um, the green credit card or debit card. And Mr. Rodriguez from Panafifo will probably be able to address that as well since he's also linked to that. Um, so we will be glad to have you all there and see you in a couple of minutes. Thank you. <laughs>